Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done nearly 700 of them now. If this is new to you and you would like to check out previous ones, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there are PayPal buttons on the website and a page that explains alternatives to PayPal. My guest today is Professor Jem Bendel. He is a world-renowned scholar on the breakdown of modern societies due to environmental damage. Downloaded over a million times, his deep adaptation paper is credited with inspiring the growth of the Extinction Rebellion movement in 2018 and created a, gro a global network, um, deep adaptation network, to reduce harm in the face of societal collapse. He completed his PhD at the University of Bristol and his geography BA with honors at the University of Cambridge. For decades, he has worked on sustainable development as a researcher and NGO manager, as well as a consultant to businesses, political parties, and UN agencies. One of his specialisms since 2011 is pro-social currency innovation, with his TED talk, TEDx talk from that year explaining reasons for Bitcoin and similar. In 2017, he co-led the development of the UK Labour Party's communications plan for the central for the general election and co-wrote speeches for their top politicians. Although recognized in 2012 as a young global leader by world, the World Economic Forum, Jem has been increasingly critical of the globalist agenda on sustainable development. Away from that work, he is partner in an organic farm school in Bali and supports meditation retreats at the main Buddhist temple on the island. And you may think that that last sentence I read is the reason why I'm having him on that gap, because usually we're talking all about spiritual things. Uh, but there's more to it than that, as you'll see as we get into this conversation. And incidentally, his latest book, you can see over his shoulder there, Breaking Together, um, I listened to the entire thing as an audio book. It's about 18 hours long. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I listened to the introduction twice. The introduction alone took over an hour to listen to. Um, but it's uh, there's a whole background in my thinking and understanding of why um, this idea of societal collapse is pertinent. Um, and I'll elaborate that as we go along. But I want to give Jem a chance to say hello and introduce himself and give us the elevator talk of, you know, what he's all about. Let's pretend there's a societal breakdown happening and they we're stuck in an elevator for two hours um, and you can give us the talk, but we can start with a, a more uh, condensed version. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for the introduction, Rick. And uh, yeah, and those who have joined us, that's good, or watching later, hello. I'm joining you from my... Uh, I'm back in my dad's apartment back in the UK. I don't live in the UK, but uh, this is where I spent quite a few months, um, particularly last year, uh, writing the book, in fact. So I'm actually looking uh, almost with a bit of nostalgia around the room, um, just that process of, of writing the book. For example, I, I opened the book about talking about my dad's parents, my grandparents, and the way they used to chat. And that's because I've got pictures of them. I just, that, that was basically why I did that, because I was sitting underneath a picture of them as I started writing. And you have to start a book somewhere. And <laughs> so that was, that was why. An elevator pitch about me or the book? Uh, the book, okay, the book's called Breaking Together. And it has a twofold hypothesis. First is that um, the foundational systems of modern industrial consumer societies are breaking they're collapsing into each other uh so it, they're not it, we're already within that process uh, that can't be fixed um and therefore i make the case that collapse is the accurate word for that even though collapse is a, an unfolding process will go on for some time and it will be experienced differently in different places but the second part of the 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 thesis in breaking together is that we can break together rather than apart in that context, by which I mean um, the fact that all the systems, the institutions um, are breaking 
it's somewhat of a judgment on their legitimacy and that therefore can invite us to rethink all our previous assumptions, preoccupations, things which kept us busy, stuff we hoped for or believed might happen one day. It brings us very much into the present moment to rethink our values, how we choose to live in this time, who do we want to be. And so it's in the, so that bigger societal breaking leads to a inner breaking which can actually allow us to be something incredible. And so in the second half of the book I talk about uh lots of people who I'm impressed by in the way they're responding to this. Um, so that's, yeah, and that's also why the subtitle is a freedom-loving response to collapse. So I, I, I recenter uh, human freedom, personal and collective, as important to a value to maintain uh, as things get tough, because... Um, the thesis in the book is that it wasn't human freedom that led to this carnage, but the fact that we have been manipulated from birth to death through something I call imperial modernity, pumped up and maintained by an expansionist monetary system, basically encouraging us to behave in ways where we feel numb about the damage in the world and we, uh, we are... Um, tough with ourselves, with each other and with nature. We feel life is, 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 is tough. And I go into great detail about the, what I call the money power and how it's promoted those dynamics and fed those aspects of, of, of ourselves that we wouldn't consider to be that great, that positive, to an extent that it then hit ecological limits and ultimately is collapsing the societies uh, that it's helped to build. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, it's promoting um, um, something what I call uh, eco libertarianism. So it was um, an attempt to make a what should we say an offer of um, a political philosophy and framework for an era of collapse, one that's uh, a political philosophy that's solidarity based. Because I see a lot of authoritarianism, a lot of nostalgia politics, uh, conservatism, all sorts uh, emerging as people get more and more nervous about their lives becoming more and more difficult and the future looking more and more bleak. So I wanted to offer something else into the mix as we try and make sense of this new era of collapse, as I call it. Okay. Um, let me, let me give you my perspective, which I already did in an email and, um, we'll, I think you agree with some of it and not with all of it, but we can play back and forth and, um, try to arrive at a common understanding. So as many of my listeners will be aware, um, a lot of people who would consider themselves spiritual or, you know, interested in, in ancient traditions, the, the wisdom traditions of the world, um, have been feeling that we're, we're due for some sort of big upheaval, uh, that the, the current systems are not sustainable, and that, um, you know, many of them sort of believe that this upheaval will be necessary and will event uh, and that on the other side of it we'll have some better world you know some more enlightened world and so on and um I, i've been thinking this way since the 70s not not as a certainty but as a you know a, a theory of how things might unfold and um the reason i've been thinking this way is well the reason I see all, like you mentioned, monetary systems. I would consider all systems, political, monetary, agricultural, uh, technological, every, everything that's a product of human beings to be a reflection of the you know, mentality or the ambient level of consciousness of the people in the world. Um, and obviously, some people are more powerful than others, more creative in, in producing things than others. But basically... It, it all reflects human mentality or human consciousness. And what people think, what, what various prophecies have predicted for many years, going back to the Babylonians and the Hopis and the Mayans and so on, is that some kind of big shift is going to happen in collective consciousness. And when that happens, or I, and I do believe it's happening now, all these systems won't work anymore because they reflect a lower level of consciousness. It's, it's like a kid who's growing quickly and trying to keep wearing the same clothes. They get too tight. He has to bust out of them and it, it, it destroys the clothes. <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, 
that's my view in a nutshell. I've been, you know, meditating as many people know for most of my life. And, um, I, I feel, you know, a big shift and I'm, I've interviewing hundreds of people, um, all of whom are undergoing really profound shifts in, in consciousness and in their awareness. And I, I buy into the, the notion of collective consciousness, perhaps reminiscent of Carl Jung's idea of the collective unconsciousness, uh, uh, collective unconscious, but that consciousness is not just a product of the brain. It's a field and brains are more like sender receivers that, that interact or tune, tune into that field. And I believe the shift is happening in collective consciousness, perhaps not so much created by people, uh, but actually people are more like surfers. They don't create the waves. They ride the waves if they're able to do so, or they wipe out if they aren't able to do so. And I, I think you're correctly predicting and explaining in, in detail how a lot of structures are going to, are wiping out. Um, but there are others who are skillfully surfing the waves and actually ex experiencing a kind of a spiritual renaissance within their own lives as a result of this upwelling of, um, you could say, enlightenment in the world. All right, so that's enough of that. And um, let's have your response to it. And I'm not in the least bit sensitive if you, if you want to disagree with any or all of it. Yeah, thank you. You've, you've covered quite a lot. So I'll start at the end. What you just said, that a lot of people are experiencing some kind of spiritual upwelling, renaissance, um, whatever, um, precisely because of their recognition of the amount of trouble in the world. And possibly if they're unlucky, they've, they've been through a hard time because of ecological damage um, and various different implications therefrom. Because we know that um, we know that hurt, we know that tragedy, we know that grief and despair even uh, can be a very uh, powerful means of people letting go. So in psychology, the theory is called positive disintegration, which is actually about even the oddly the even the benefit of proper clinical depression in part of that spiritual transformation. So. And that's, yeah, as you say, you mentioned ancient wisdom. So even the, in, in the Tao Te Ching, they the talk about the path to illumination is through the dark. So you can find it in all spiritual traditions, this, this, the importance of this dark night of the soul. So yes, um, I, I, I would say that's happening a lot. And so, and that was, I mean, the guy who introduced us, Reverend Michael Dow, that was a big, part of his message and that was what he really was dedicating the last years of his life to um he passed away recently very recently and very suddenly unexpectedly and it's amazing to see how many people um really just were impacted powerfully by him but the clarity of his post doom message that you, know, you can't avoid the despair once you realize how much carnage is on happened already happening now going to happen um why it's been done and how we knew for so long but didn't change all of that pain you can't just sidestep it and make it go away but but there's there's something else on the other side of that the pain of that realization um which which is yeah to live in wonder gratitude uh, recommit to service creativity live your life try and be the best best ever person you can be precisely because you have that feeling of um essentially mortality on your shoulder um again that's you know again back to spiritual wisdom ram das talked about living with 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 death on your shoulder and and love in your heart so so just just at the end of what you were saying i just want to connect with you on that and say absolutely um at an individual level um that's something I'm noticing and then therefore at a community level because a lot of those people are connecting to help each other and to realize that people can respond not necessarily in that way that I've just described which is some kind of ego transcendence because of this realization people can respond sort of almost like with ego affirmation and psychologists call it worldview defense there's something called terror management theory I don't know if you come across it but whereby where people feel threatened 
they feel their safety threatened, they therefore feel their identity and worldview threatened, and they can double down on it and become quite illogical about it and ultimately violent. And the theory arose from analysing the rise of religious fundamentalisms, but I think it applies very much to looking at people in in within modernity, then um, sort of, for example, some scientists who are very committed to the IPCC, the, the climate change, uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change, doubling down on how good it is, that methodology, and how perfect it is according to scientific norms, despite current temperature measurements. Of Which methodology are they doubling down on? Oh, the, the, the desire for consensus. So, so the desire with the IPCC, there's a desire for consensus where you, there needs to be a preponderance of information published, peer reviewed, uh, for it to then be considered um, uh, as, a, as a acceptable. However, if you, what that means then, I, 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 for example, in my book, I talk about it. It meant that in, um, uh, in 2014, in their big report, they were talking about future sea level rise. Um, and the lowest range of the projection was actually lower than measured sea level rise from satellite measurements in that year. And that was because um, there had been dispute over how much uh, melt from uh, glaciers on land was going to contribute to sea level rise compared to other things, basically thermal expansion of the oceans. So they, because there was dispute about how much it would add, they disregarded it altogether. So that is one example, but it shows you if there wasn't consensus, they would disregard it. And there's huge complexity, for example, around uh, tipping points, and therefore very difficult to agree with that. And so a number of positive, so-called positive and self-amplifying feedbacks were also set aside. Not all of them, but it's that desire for consensus. So the thing is now, September was 1.8 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial average temperatures, um, which is decades ahead of official consensus scientific projections of the past. And yet you still have some people in the field of science doubling down on their view that people like me, and there are many people like me, who five years ago said, this looks really bad and much worse than what the IPCC have been telling us. Um, they're doubling down on that we were wrong, we were reckless, we were unscientific, we were naughty, we were upsetting people unnecessarily, and that we should just stick with the consensus establishment science they're saying that now even though it's pretty well it's obvious <laughs> i'll say it as plainly as that people like me who were trying to spot what was most salient so for example i was looking specifically at what the oceanographers studying the pacific were saying um um I see my camera flashing there whoops i'm sorry about that but um it's blinking a little bit we were, okay. we, we we were right and the people who were slavishly following ipcc were wrong now that doesn't need to be um, uh, doesn't need to just be seen in terms of uh, vindication. Science, when it's siloed and institutionalized, it's self-restricting in how well it can understand what's salient to society. And there's a huge amount of literature on that. Yeah, I think I will. I'll just I'll switch my camera because this one okay. is going a bit. Wobbly, and while you're doing that, I'll say something, and it won't matter. Yeah, if I'll be on I camera. haven't talked about ancient civilizations and all that. Oh, I want to talk to you about we'll, that because we'll, we'll get that's a big that. part of your and and higher consciousness and whether we're going through a all that jazz, a phase that of the transformation of of yeah. All right. So I'll, yeah. I'm, I'm not quite. I'm, I'm okay. on a different camera uh, now. Yeah, so uh, swivel your just, your screen so that your top of your head isn't cut off. Just a just a tad. There you go. All right, there we That's go. enough. Good, good, good. Okay, keep going. All righty. Really, you don't want to say something? Otherwise, I'll. Oh, I can say something. Um, I just didn't oh, want to cut that, you off. Or I could I could address some of the other things you were just saying. I, I really. Well, would I like just want to. I'll, I'll make a couple of real brief comments and then let you okay. take it away. Um, so about consensus. Obviously, science is supposed to work by consensus, but scientists are all very siloed because they have to specialize in their little niche in order to advance the field. And um, a lot of them, I don't just don't communicate with each other. And um, also, uh, scientific consensus, even if it's broad, can be wrong. For instance, the, the, the mm. predominant paradigm is that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain functioning, whereas uh, on a growing number of people like David Lorimer and the Scientific Medical and Science and Medical Network and many others feel that consciousness is fundamental and everything arises from that. So that's it. And if they're right, then, then the whole scientific 
edifice is upside down. And an- yeah. another thing I just want to say quickly, and then I'll get it back to you, is here in the U.S. I mean, you talked about the Pacific just just the other day. A, a tropical storm turned into a Category Five hurricane in five hours and uh, in twelve hours and devastated Acapulco. Um, you know, so and yet half the politicians in the United States won't admit that climate change is a real thing um, and don't want to do anything about it. Trump said it was a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese to gain some economic advantage, and I occasionally I hear from some climate denier who brings up Judith Curry. I don't know if you've heard of Judith Curry, but she's this woman who has credentials and who says that all the, uh, that, that there is not a like 99% uh, agreement that uh, climate change is being caused by human beings, but that scientists are kind of cowed into t- towing the line in order to get funding and stuff. And if they were to dispute the, the predominant narrative, they would lose their careers and so on. So anyway, that's a few different random points that we, I'm sure you can sew it together and get onto the ancient cultures. Yeah. So um, when I was talking about uh, this issue of terror, what terror management theory tells us about um, worldview defense, and there can be this doubling down on your worldview and identity in ways that become illogical and quite aggressive. Um, so I, I had, and I gave the, I said, it's, so that's not just religious fundamentalists, that's, that's also, um, it can be uh, climate scientists, and we're beginning to see that. And so the reason I was making that point is that the response to the terrible situation we're in for the, the, the world's biosphere and, and the implications for societies and ourselves and everyone we, we love, the, the, the terrible situation we're in can lead to the ego transcendence. The, it, it, it can, it is a spiritual invitation and some people can respond to that invitation. However, that's not my view is and my experience of that and also psychology research, I believe, shows that um, that's not certain at all. Um, and in fact, so I published a psych- psycho- uh, in a psychotherapy journal on this. In fact, it's when people feel very unstable and threatened, they can also become authoritarian because what you do is you try and find a new form, a new identity structure, a new form of safety, a new kind of belonging. You have this generalized anxiety. You're told where to run to and who to trust and who to hate, who to blame. So, what, so that then, lead, Hannah Arendt and others say that that is that was what was happening with uh, through the Industrial Revolution and changes to society, which led to fascism rising in Europe. So we could see some of those same potential responses today. So this, not only the breakdown of societies, but the recognition of just how bad it is, the terror associated with that, deep existential terror, the loss of a sense of meaning can be either a moment of spiritual transformation or it can be a moment of derangement uh, being manipulated by populist authoritarians, uh, becoming aggressive and leading to lots of violence. So I believe there is a role to play for people who get this, who've done their own work, who can find a way of being calm within this storm and help people see that, um, help people through this. And so, yeah, with the Deep Adaptation Forum that I started, we we kicked off, I think, in March 2019. I worked with it for about um, 18 months and then left it. But very much it was focused on how can we help each other be with this really emotionally tough realization rather than just sort of rush to, oh, we'll fix it with nuclear power or, oh, I don't know, a billionaire will fix it or, oh, we can't do anything, blame the Chinese or what, or it's a hoax. Yeah, it's just a hoax. They just want to control us. We just wanted to help people be in the pain, support each other, work through the emotions and think what the options for the future for them, their communities might be. So that was, that was the initial focus of that. And that was why. So you can see already that no, I, uh, I do not agree with you that this will sort of make almost like a, an inevitable collective transformation of human consciousness to, to, to a higher level. Um, no, I didn't and, use the word inevitable, by the way, but continue. Okay. Oh, but some people do. Very, very, some people do. Yeah. Um, so, so I, 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 
I don't see what I see is that there are different ways of responding and part of the way I can feel okay with my understanding of the world as I as I see it the way I can feel okay is to try and help more people respond curiously kindly creatively bravely um that gives me a sense of meaning um and a sense of joy and I don't think I have, would have any other way of responding so I want to go back to what you were saying about um let, let me just uh, interject something the, there. The hockey you... prophecies and the right. idea that we're going to go through a lot of trouble is, but that's just almost like a rite of passage, basically, like a, a maturing of the human species and our consciousness to emerge into a, uh, a spiritual and ecological civilization, perhaps. But we, if you want to, yeah, I'll talk about that a bit later if you want to no, say in, something. No, in else, just but... a second, let me just quick uh, comment mm. on what you just said. So, for some mm. reason, I was reminded of Rudyard Kipling's poem, If, you know, if you can keep your head while all about you are losing theirs. Um, oh, yes. As you were saying that. And uh, I was on a boat ride with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in 1974, and he was talking about this phase transition, as he called it, that was going to happen. And some, it was sounding a little scary. And someone said, well, how can we survive this? And he said, hold on to the self. And by that, he meant kind of capital S self, you know, in the Advaita sense of, you know, realize your true nature. So I think this is where spiritual practice comes in because I, and you were talking about how different people react to uh, societal chaos in different ways. Some, some, you know, go scampering to the, to the dictators and, and others find it as a, as a catalyst to spiritual awakening. Um, you know, there's, I think that um, whatever else one does, if, and I believe you follow this advice, uh, if you have some kind of effective spiritual practice or orientation or something, it's going to help because you'll realize that there's a, you'll experience that there's a deeper dimension to life that is unperturbed by the chaos that, that happens on the surface. And it'll help you, you know, help you whatever happens even if you die <laughs> it'll be good to have that inner presence uh to as an anchor as a foundation okay back to you yeah yeah so i've found it helpful i found a number of things helpful in myself um i learned a lot through doing a vipassana and doing it with a monk who uh really it was just a wonderful experience because i think there were only about six of us and we had quite a while uh, every day then in in dialogue one-to-ones with the monk and this unpacking this disaggregating of 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 stimulus reaction um emotion thought new emotion <laughs> uh you know and then or disaggregating all the stuff that goes on and then realizing wow i i can have different mind states which will make me more um able to just witness and let go um yeah, more, a calmer open more loving and gentle to myself and to the world mind state or i can have a more fearful one or a grumpy one and and how that all influences the all, all that all that chain of events between stimulus feeling thought feeling thought action and so that it is i guess another way of talking about it is just recognizing the extent to which we ourselves and everyone is a bit bonkers and that if you can just slow down the process <laughs> so that we have a we breathe and, and we can witness what's going on then that within that there's a the chance for more wisdom it doesn't necessarily mean there's more wisdom um but there's the chance for it so obviously yeah mindfulness meditation um and also for me, uh, discovering something called uh, authentic relating and circling, and I use that a lot in my in my teaching on these topics um, because it's basically doing meditation but in dialogue because you're witnessing what's going on with you as you're engaging with another. And in Buddhism, it's also uh, some people call it insight dialogue. These techniques, um, and uh, yeah, but that that I, I was blessed to have discovered those two processes in order to therefore um not just be consumed by my feelings but and and i've had periods of of panic 
looking at some of the science over the last five years and then looking at the news of, of what's happened with, you know, more, more uh, I don't know, 30 degrees in the Arctic Circle of tundra uh, forest fires and permafrost melting and stuff. And uh, I've had, uh, you know, it, it does trigger in me often these waves of, of, of uh, yeah, a kind of panic. And, but at least I can witness it and see it as these things are just happening to me. The other stuff, of course, is... um any spiritual tradition any invites us into a, a, a different sense of time um, and that so we're not so bothered with either um, like what am I doing this year or what am I going to achieve in my life even it's just realizing there's an eternal flow and um, so that sense of in, expanse of reality can also help in my case um, and in many people's cases, there is this, there is what is known as faith to many people, which is that no matter how bad things are, no matter how unnecessary the amount of suffering and destruction that's happened and is happening now and is to come, there's some kind of deep ultimate rightness. And, and it's a faith which is, is not super logical. Um, it's experiential. Um, um, uh, it's connected to mystery and wonder and just going, wow, isn't it bizarre and amazing to be alive and that existence exists? <laughs> so for me, that's a faith which is also sustaining it. it, it uh, and I know, um, that can sound a bit odd to some people like, um, oh, that's just your privilege speaking. Uh, when you're really suffering, is that really going to be there? But I, I hear from people who've had terrible suffering that that faith has stayed with them. Um, so yeah, so to connect immediately on that point, but, um, uh, yes, absolutely. But you mentioned some other things. There are two things you mentioned. You mentioned Judith Curry and climate oh, yes. denialism. Do you remember? And oh, yeah. you mentioned, and, uh, you mentioned, um, ancient prophecies and, and the fact that there are lots of people who have since the seventies realized that we're living in an unsustainable industrial consumer society and there will be a collapse and there will be a transformation and and yet they've they've had this in sort of a way of this is this is what we need to go through and then we all reach the promised land perhaps in the end but and then you you um you mentioned uh, the, well, what an amazing phrase to say that you were on a boat with Maharaj. <laughs> Great. Anyway, that one. Okay, so I'll just start with Judith Curry because that's the least interesting. Should we get that one out of the way? Okay, good. You have a good memory, by the way. I appreciate that you recall all these points and you're coming back to them. So, um, so actually, Judith Curry is a bit right and a hell of a lot wrong. So she's she's a bit right that um, there is uh institutional pressure on uh climate scientists who want to succeed and get funding and climb up the career ladder and that they have had what's called carbon tunnel vision um she and john christie and others are right that there was a huge attempt to make it all about carbon dioxide and play down other factors that influence not only climate in the past, because of course climate was influenced by all manner of things before humans influenced it, but also to play down other possible impacts on climate right now and in the future. So my chapter in the book actually says, yes, you're right, Judith Curry and uh, John Christie and the others, that there was a little bit of um, um, massaging of the data sets in order to produce the hockey stick graph to uh, make the medieval warm period not appear uh, and to ignore the fact that actually prior to human influence um, temperatures rose global ambient global average temperatures rose hundreds of years prior to carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere rising so this is called the carbon lag and they hit that now that doesn't mean that we don't have a massive problem. It means the opposite. It means the problem is far worse. It means that because temp because we put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 50% more CO2 in the atmosphere in the last 200 years, it is without doubt a gas which traps infrared heat and will warm up the planet. But what that means is we've done that. We've raised temperatures. And what the paleontological records show is that means we have committed carbon, meaning as the oceans warm up, 
they will release more carbon dioxide. As the soils warm up, they will release more carbon dioxide. As the forests get hotter and uh, drier and more diseased, they will burn more and they will switch from being sinks to sources of carbon dioxide. And that's being shown already for many of the world's most important forests. So it's a lot worse than what mainstream climatologists say. So I say to the carbon, uh, to the climate skeptics like Curry and Christie and the rest, you're right, and therefore it's a hell of a lot worse. So it's not the so it's not what you're saying it is. The other thing is um, the carbon tunnel vision meant that we didn't focus on the hydrological cycle and how it's very clear that forests now play a global role in seeding clouds. So for example, the pollen and the bacteria given off by the Amazon will not just seed clouds above the Amazon through evapotranspiration locally, but will actually seed clouds in Tibet. And what this means is, is that the world cloud cover is influenced by the amount of forest cover on the ground. And we have trashed forests. We've cleared as much in the last 200 years, I think, as in the previous 9,000. And, and this rate went up massively since the 70s through economic globalization and, and basically spreading consumer capitalism around the planet, uh, in since the 1970s. And so, um, that correlates with a rapid rise in temperature. And so, yeah, I, in my book, I talk about how we need to broaden our understanding of the climate emergency. It's not just carbon, it's also methane, it's also forest cover. Uh, and we have to accept that actually, um, it might well be totally catastrophic for life on Earth, including our own species already, and we can't do anything about it because of the committed carbon, because of the amount of heating that we've already we've already started. We're already looking at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial in 2023, decades ahead of when the official projections were. So um, a lot of people hear that, and they think immediately because they maybe have, haven't disaggregated the thought, emotion, reaction, mind state and critically analyzed their culture because they're totally wedded to consequentialist ethics. And they think, well, that guy who's just said that he's telling me to give up. He's telling me not to try and uh, cut carbon, draw down carbon, uh, restore uh, ecosystems. No, I'm not. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying, don't do that with any fairy tale that we're fixing the climate and we're getting out of this mess. So do it, do it. Absolutely. Let's do as much as we can, but don't be attached to the outcome. Um, and most people, if they allow the despair, I'm talking about environmentalists who work on this stuff, allow the despair. They don't just quit. They don't say, Oh, I don't care anymore. I don't want us to, you know, cut carbon or uh, res res restore wetlands and forests and, um, you know, get toxics out of our food chain or whatever. They don't. They go back to it. They go back to it with a passion, but without being so attached to stories of techno salvation and everything getting fixed. So that's my answer to, um, uh, Judith Curry and all that lot. And that's why I really recommend people who are interested in climate change read chapter five or listen to it like you did for free on SoundCloud or download it for free. You can jenbendal.com. It's an EPUB. Um, or you can I'll buy put a, it. I'll put a link back. to it on your bath gap page. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I'm, I'm, so I'm a contrarian on climate because in the same way we talked earlier about the problem of institutional and siloed climatology uh, or, or any science, it has its limitations and there are silos, there are hierarchies, there's cultural influences. And, um, so yeah, and that's, so yeah, I am persona non grata with people like Professor Michael Mann, who Curry and Christie hate, <laughs> because they were, I think, fighting with him in the early days of the IPCC stuff about all this. And, uh, he, he, he won basically and they lost. And so they're pissed off with him. And, but yeah, Michael Mann ha hates my, my work. Um, because he wants to keep it in a, you know, this is a gradual warming. And as long as we, have the right technologies and the right policies and the right entrepreneurship, the right leadership and all the little people do as you're told, then we'll fix it. That's been, he his probably narrative. believes that, you know, well, it's been, his, that's been his narrative and, and I have not talked to him. I have no idea what he really believes, but, but he, maybe he absolutely believes it. I, I have no, I have no evidence to say he doesn't believe it, but you know but what I, I wish, uh, I wish <laughs> that, 
I wish that there were public de- debates properly moderated so people aren't just shouting at each other uh, and quite lengthy like this interview where each right. side and on, on various issues, you know, COVID vaccines and, uh, you know, climate change and, and gun rights and abortion and all the issues that are tearing society apart, because otherwise it's, it, it's like, you know, here in the States, uh, you know, some people are listening to the extreme right wing media, others to the extreme left wing media, and they just get their their assumptions reinforced. But there's no communication. And there there is probably some truth on both sides, although, as Stephen Colbert puts it, I think he said that the truth has a liberal bias. <laughs> At least that's my bias. But um, in any case, I wish there were there were public dialogues where people could engage um, in, you know, really learning. Uh, and and hear both sides and and give people ample time to to rebut each other. That would be so healthy. Mm. I agree, and we've got the opposite of, the, of that, as you said. And what's extremely painful for me, having spent uh, almost three years working on this book, so you know, the first eighteen months were commissioning research papers from specialists in various areas, and then working with them because it's covering all manner of areas of uh, of scholarship. And then 18 months, or well, yeah, a year writing it, um, is that, um, like, for example, there's a whole chapter on free will. I spent a long time looking at that. And that's also based on ye- previous years of interest and reading on it. And someone will send me a one minute TikTok video from <laughs> someone who I may have finished her undergraduate, but she labels herself uh, your friendly neighborhood neuroscientist who's. Uh, saying no there's no free will because a study shows that it there is no free will yeah. because uh, they measured that there was a s- impulse from i don't know in the arm to say, tell the hand to move before the brain had sent it to the arm and i have i, it's, I talked about that good. study yeah i talked about that study just last week in my interview with ruth kastner who's a physicist that study has right. been thoroughly re- re- rebutted and, and dis- totally rebutted, and yeah. it doesn't take you very long. You could just type in, <laughs> type into, uh, type into Google that that like uh, what was the study? You could use AI now. What was the study that showed this? It would come up with the name of the study, and then you just go to Google Scholar. Even you don't even have to use any of the more than Google Scholar, and just type it in, and then see who's referenced it, and then you'll see the number of rebuttals or people who tried to do the same study or proved how it was wrong and and <laughs> how no one else has managed to do a good neuroscientific study disproving free will and it's precisely because no one's have managed to create an, a good study experimentally disproving free will with neuroscience that people keep referring back to that one which is old and debunked and guess what no it's fresh now it's got a million hits on tiktok and i'm being sent this by my friend it's like I, yeah, since when did you decide that this is how you're going to learn about the universe? <laughs> Which is kind of cute. Oh, is that why? Okay. Well, you know, I'm probably not going to be a TikTok star. I'm not cute enough. But so, yeah, it's, we are going in the wrong way in that sense. But what I've realized is if, if you are more than an armchair um, observer, if you are engaged in any issue, of public note, current affairs, um, more than just wanting to feel good about yourself, get a dopamine hit, get a few likes on on Facebook. You're you're more involved in it than wanting to feel angry and self righteous in order to have a bit of escape from your general anxiety or or, or sort of dull feeling of meaningless life. If you're more involved in an issue, whatever it is, than those those reasons. Um, you want you you want to know you want to dig and and inquire you want to hear differences of opinion you want to ch- check and double check your understanding, and therefore, for me, the people who've most committed to really understanding this are the people who have decided to risk arrest and going to prison, the climate activists and Extinction Rebellion, five years ago, when they decided that they were going to lock on. Um, glue themselves to trucks or whatever, they had to really convince themselves that what they were doing was based on a fair analysis of the science. And they really, really looked into it properly. And they were right. And what's amazing is three of the XR uh, co-founders, Extinction Rebellion co-founders, just published a letter saying, um, 
what they should have just said is, hey, everybody, we got it right. And all you sort of careerist uh, climatologists who slagged us off in the mass media made us out to be extremists who got the science wrong. Well, you were wrong. But <laughs> but no, they, they were basically saying um, we got it almost right, but we had a bit of carbon tunnel vision. that We should have been thinking about aerosols. We should have been thinking about, thinking about forest cloud seeding. We should have been realized that ocean health matters, matters massively to the climate. We, we should have realized it was a broader agenda. We tried to talk about it as a broader agenda, the ecological crisis, not just climate. We tried to stick to the idea that this is a near and present danger for us and our loved ones. But we had all these climatologists with all the power of, you know, sitting on IPCC committees and all this sort of, we want to help you. We want to help you be more scientific. And we watered down our analysis and our message and, and we shouldn't have done because actually they were wrong and we were right. So, yeah, there was a public letter that, that um, and then in response to that, 70 scholars from around the world, 30, uh, 16 countries, I was one of them, we signed a letter saying, the scientific community needs to learn from its mistakes. It needs to realize also when it's badly disparaged uh, scholarly activists now who are facing prison, um, and an apology would be the least way of making amends. As far as I know, the many, many climatologists who've said many derogatory things about climate activists in the last five years uh, haven't come out and apologized and said actually they were right and I was wrong. Um, well, um, you know, I, I, I agree. I agree with what all these climate activists are saying, and and I agree with what you're saying. And, and you know, who am I to agree? But based upon my paltry understanding, I think you're right. But I, I do take issue with throwing tomato soup at artworks or, you know, gluing yourself to stuff. I mean, that just makes these people seem crazy. And th I think it weakens their credibility, you know, to, to most people. Um, do you do you agree with those tactics? I mean, surely it makes headlines, but it makes headlines like, wow, these people are nuts. <laughs> so, yeah, well, the tomato soup wasn't actually on on the artwork itself. They they chose the ones that had glass, uh, glass pane. Oh, covers. That, that was nice of them. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Still kind of. The thing is, is that the thing is that many, many uh, climate act. I mean, that that's the Just Stop Oil campaign, a spinoff to Extinction Rebellion. Many. Um, Many of the activists in Extinction Rebellion do many, many things. And it is interesting that, um, that the ones we've heard of are the ones you've mentioned. Now, would you have heard of all the other things that they've been doing if the ones didn't throw the tomato soup on, on a, on a, on a glass covered painting? This is the problem with the way our media communications are in the world, that, that these stunts seem to be the only things that, You'll get to get hear attention. of. So if yeah. if so if they didn't do it, you wouldn't hear about what X Extinction Rebellion is doing otherwise, really. So I I don't I don't waste my time. I don't I don't participate in those kind of nonviolent direct actions, disrupting sports events and stuff. It's not my bag. But um, but I'm I am aware of and I acknowledge I acknowledge the argument of people like Roger Hallam who say that people like you, Rick, and people like me, if we really believe this to be an existential crisis that will fundamentally uh, change everything and damage everything and cause awful, awful, it already is, but will cause a lot more awful problems in society. Um, yeah, his message is get out on the streets and, okay, do something else, but it's nonviolent civil disobedience. And the only reason why they're doing these sort of high profile stunts is because there aren't enough of people like you and me alongside people on the streets causing havoc in a peaceful way. Um, that's his message. I acknowledge it. And I believe it's, it's equally valid to my view, which is, I don't think there's much point in doing that. I'm much more interested in uh, getting ready for in communities for the collapse, which I believe has already begun. So I'm more interested in turning to where neighbors who, where I live, um, to try and, uh, prepare for the breakdown of industrial consumer way of life and to learn from this and to resist authoritarianism in all its forms 
And I actually think uh, some of these activist stunts actually sort of help legitimate authoritarianism because it mean, leads to more draconian policing, more draconian laws, uh, more, I think, undemocratic use of the court systems by judges. I can't go into that too much because because um, there's ridiculous behaviour of, of judges in the UK to restrict trial by proper trial by jury. Um, so... So yeah, I, I acknowledge his argument and I disagree with it. I'm choosing a different path, but but I wouldn't. But, okay. But yeah. Okay. Should we go back to those prophecies and whether? Yes. Good. You read my mind. Uh-huh. <laughs> um. Um. Anyone today in a in a Western or even no, let's not even say Western. Anyone today in a modern urban culture um, reading about ancient civilizations. And their prophecies, reading about or learning about indigenous peoples and communities alive today. Any of us looking at that, we're bringing our own mental models from modernity. And that means we think, although we think we might be learning, we're actually projecting from our culture onto their own forms of wisdom. So I talk about that in the book as well. So, um, some of the habits of modernity, which are very deeply ingrained, is this idea of um, anthropocentrism or anthropo- anthroposupremacy, the idea that somehow uh, reality exists with us at the centre. Um, that's one thing. Another is that um, we're always progressing, either, either materially or in some other way. So, like, what is new can be better will be better than the past so just let's just take two of those things so um with that you can end up coming up with the the ideas in conscious evolution where it's like well you know we, we 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 have a it's our destiny as humans to to evolve to a higher consciousness uh and i think the opposite could be what's happened because there is such incredible wisdom in indigenous societies um and also um i think about it uh, i i i think i may have mentioned it into my email to you i can't remember um when i i i'm working not with that many but with a few farmers in bali um in my organic farm school and they don't have all the education and they don't really know about all manner of things it would be weird to talk about a planetary future what's for the whole of homo sapiens and that's all just weird blah blah i don't think they are any less um awake in fact i think they might be more awake than the people who write blogs and send emails about a global brain awakening and the planetary consciousness emerging um i actually I, I really don't like what I think is the implicit modernity and patriarchy uh, and anthro so anthropo supremacy that's sort of l- lingering in that in the, in that worldview that we are uh, all going to come together in a global consciousness that's that that's um, awakening and progressing. Um, I think it's yeah, it's patriarchal. It's like no sod it. Why can't you just be happy that? What is really frightening, I think, for a lot of people in Western modern culture is that, no, it, it's our culture that was omnicide, that is omnicidal, that humans lived for hundreds of thousands of years without screwing up the planet in the way that we've done in 200 years. And there are, even today, 4% of the world's population is indigenous. And they, where they live, there's over about 80% of the world's biodiversity. Now, what does that tell you? Um, and if you look at if you look again, not not also, this is also a bit annoying to hear for some people, but so much of the archaeology and anthropology of the past years has been racist. So basically it's 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 assumed that the first peoples were somehow uh, not stewarding and working with their environments. And actually looking at it again, for example, now we know that the Amazon was not a wild untouched environment, but a wild gardened one. And that hundreds, if not thousands of species in the Amazon are because of millennia of human settlement. Um, and there are many examples of that in, in North America too. So 
No, there was incredible complexity, incredible wisdom, and trashed by uh, Eurocentric culture originally, colonialism, but then that became this sort of what I call imperial modernity and, and taken to the extreme, uh, like all of that on cocaine because of an expansionist monetary system. And it, a lot of people, uh, uh, older people, privileged people, often white, living in the West, are attracted to stories which absolve any sense of guilt. And and I think you don't need that, but I know a lot of people do. So it'd be like, oh, this was predetermined overshoot. Any species would, would, would do this. And it was just, what was it in the William Catton book, uh, natural exuberance? No, not at all. That's not mm -hmm. what the latest scholarship shows. Um, so just because our culture, our system, when I say our, I mean modernity, which came from colonialism originally, and just because of that is at fault for Omnicide, uh, doesn't mean that we sort of just get lost in self-hatred. Um, an, an interest in an aversion to blame and shame is itself an aspect of modernity and the Abrahamic religions that modernity was built on. You can just let all that go. And that's what I've also loved from my own Buddhist reading and sinking into this and this notion of pre-forgiveness because the way we are is just as uh, the way the way somebody else is and the way I am is just the same consciousness having a different life experience. So there's no sort of possibility of damnation of self or other um, in some kind of deep level. So you don't need to worry about shame and blame. Um, so yeah, I have a. I, I actually believe that the stories of uh, the problems of our time being necessary to go through to uh, some sort of higher consciousness, I see that as culturally very specific, pretty racially uh, and culturally insensitive, um, uh, and and is and um, the people who like it tend to be people of privilege in a particular culture because it makes them feel better about the horrors of what's happened and what's to come. Um, so yeah, that's my take on on that. And the positive side of it, I would say, is that um, and how it relates to a a more sort of beautiful heart opening kind of philosophy is uh, simply um, nature and the universe is perfectly imperfect. We don't need to think about any transformation to get somewhere. Um, you know, the, we, we label things good and bad. This is a, this is a human thing that we do. Um, but life is unfolding and we don't really understand why. And all the destruction is super painful. Um, but if eternity, if there is eternity, then life will come again, both on this planet and elsewhere in the universe. And if we believe that organic life or complex life, even if it's not organic, is, is somehow, um, deeply meaningful in the universe, then the possibility for that always existed to create it, what we are today. So it still exists. So, so you, you, um, so for me, actually, what I've learned from my reading of Buddhism is just is this deeper acceptance of everything that we might label good and evil, good, bad, dark, light, um, it just sort of is. And um, so I want to be as present to it and as uh, engaged with it. I want to witness it and I want to be there for other people as much as I can be and not lose myself too much into stories of sacrifice and service. I want to also have fun, um, not therefore not be bitter about, about anything. Okay. <laughs> A lot to respond to in there. Um, you may be aware of Brian Thomas swim, you know, Brian, mm -hmm. um, I interviewed him, uh, I don't know, a while back, a year ago, maybe he has a nice little quote, which is that you leave hydrogen alone for 13.7 billion years and you end up with giraffes, uh, opera and, uh, <laughs> I don't know, rose bushes or something. And, um, you know, that illustrates nicely a point, which I believe, which is that the universe itself is one huge giant evolution machine, um, mm -hmm. you know, gr greater and greater complexity is being, or is arising out of, out of, uh, you know, simplicity. And, yes. and in so doing, uh, forms are being created through which uh, the 
primordial intelligence that gives rise to the whole thing can it can become a living reality through you and me and mosquitoes and and angels or whatever else may exist, uh, Indonesian farmers. Um, but everything's evolving. I would say everything's evolving. Um, you you said in your email to me that these farmers in Indonesia don't need to evolve spiritually. I, it, that's just a matter of sort of philosophy, I think. But I think everything is evolving spiritually, like it or not. Um, everything, everyone. And um, this thing about the ancient cultures... Um, Firstly, you know, again, there's no inevitability. I, I didn't use that word. Um, our my friend uh, Dwayne Elgin made a little video in which he outlines several different possible scenarios of how things might go. Each of them involves breakdown into chaos, but the first one would be continuing chaos for a long time. Second one would be some kind of AI-driven Chinese-style authoritarian world. And the third one would be that we do experience a spiritual renaissance out of the ashes, so to speak. And, uh, you know, all this this collapse will have been necessary, will be seen as having been necessary for that to come about, because under the current systems and structures, it really couldn't come about. Um, so um, you might you know, go ahead. I, I might ramble if I continue any longer. You, you want to respond to those bits? And there's um, a couple of questions that came in too that I'll ask. Yeah, you I would add, uh, to Dwayne's one. I would add a fourth, which is that um, where this idea of collapse going for a long time, but there will be good and bad. There will be spiritual renaissances and uh, the opposite of that all happening at the same time. So for me, I, I see a future for the human race this century of there being a lot of beauty, joy, love, spiritual transformation, and also a lot of hate and violence and uh, stupidity, ignorance, um, delusion, derangement, and... Uh, and As there is right now. I mean, so yeah, many people so, are li so, you know, living yeah. these so blessed lives, need, you know, and yeah, then there's all hell breaking loose. So in terms of, a vi I mean, I talk about this in the book, is that, okay, so if some people say, yeah, okay, what, you, what you've said sounds right, but... Um, but don't you have a vision? And I say, well, yes, I do, because I believe that so much of the suffering is as a result not of human nature, not as of our freedoms, but because we've been so oppressed through an expansionist monetary system and the way it's shaped us. And I talk about that in great detail in Chapter 10 in the ways that it's shaped our experience of reality and encouraged us to behave and feel and think in certain ways and not others. And so, yeah, my vision is that where we are freed, more and more of us are freed from that in order to be more of ourselves, which what does that mean? Well, it means to be more in discovery of what it is to be us and to be in connection with others and to be in connection with nature. And um, for some people, that might include experiencing non-ordinary states of consciousness which might affirm their sense that consciousness it just isn't in here, um, but is shared. It might include them realizing that maybe there's some sort of universal consciousness. They may label it God. They may label it the Akashic record. Mm -hmm. They they may label it an Atman or an Anatman or whatever. I don't, whatever, you know, loads of words out there, concepts, framings out there. And I've got to the point of thinking that if you start getting attached to those stories, those then then you're back in fear you're needing order to latch on to and so i'm i'm just you know some people won't some people will 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 have joyful caring loving lives and they won't they won't necessarily have had an altered state of consciousness where they've experienced we space or universal transcendent being and they will think that when they die that's it they're just skin and bones and they're gone and um, then they'll be pleasantly they'll surprised still, <laughs> well, yeah, but also they'll just be there, but, but they'll be loving, caring, good people anyway. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Do this. I mean, so, you know, I, I know mean, people I, who've been meditating for, for decades who yeah. are absolute jerks, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. You don't have to be. Well, in, I, in fact, there's a sort of a. I think a spiritual egotism that often happens with right. with spirits you know, who yeah. th they think they're superior and and, and they're fussy so and this, intolerant. I had this very recently because because death of a loved one really, really helps bring this into um, into focus. So you know, my dad just died what three days ago, and um, sitting by his lifeless body, saying goodbye, I um 
I said out loud, so dad, I don't know. I don't know whether I'm speaking to you as a consciousness right here, right now, which is like a congruent dad consciousness. And if it is, I want to say this. And then I don't know if you're just merged with the universal consciousness already. And like, whoa, what a trip that is. So you've like rejoined, like, wow, lucky you. I mean, that's weird. Look, there I am next to my dead dad. But if that's true, wow. And then, oh, geez, there might be a, but even in that way, there might be an, an imprint on that Akashic record that is dad consciousness, Peter Bendel consciousness, that will be reincarnated in a new life form. It's like, wow, you've got an amazing trip ahead of you. Cool. Um, or you're just, that's it. None of you exists anymore apart from him, the impacts you've had on people. And the, the, the ability of people like me to now have a conversation in my head with my idea of you, which I've been doing, which is fascinating to find I was having this conversation with my dad in the hours before I got to the, to the nursing home, knowing he'd passed. So it was almost like he'd come alive as a, as a being for me to talk to. But maybe that's the only way that he's still alive, which is so just in, in people's memories and, uh, of him. And then I thought, well, if that's the case, well, this is what I want to say to you, do you know? And I, and, um, and I think even if I have more we space moments and more periods of experiencing collective consciousness and telepathy, and so I've had all of those. I'm lucky I've had those in my life. I say I'm lucky because it means I know there is more. And I'm not quite sure how there is more. Like, I don't know what words are best for describing it. I don't, um, I don't think my, my dad ever, uh, wasn't as lucky. I don't think he ever had any of that. But, um, but I think I'd be okay with that not knowing the way I've just described it. Because if we get attached to the stories, as you were saying, people who meditate for decades as well, I think it's just, I think it takes us away from just being nice and kind to each other and ourselves. <laughs> so. I think that's, that's the bottom that's line. Yeah. I mean, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And, and you know, like, I don't think that if somebody's been meditating for decades, it means that they're more highly evolved spiritually than some simple, you know, farmer or, or some any anybody else. Uh, we all come in at different levels. And uh, so there was another point I was making there when I said that, which is that basically an Indonesian farmer uh, like like a Kadek is in my mind. So he's our farm manager. I mean, his his carbon footprint and the ecological footprint is infinitesimal compared to the many people who will be pontificating about some great you know spiritual revolution after uh, the collapse and carnage of the biosphere and modern societies, which they've contributed to far more. Right. Which which doesn't mean they're so, not right. Do, there do, might do be know? some spiritual revolution, even though they're polluting like heck. Yeah, but do you see what I mean? It's like, well, maybe Kadek doesn't need a spiritual revolution. Do, do, do what I'm saying is, it's a very culturally specific story, and this is it. Stories do they 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 become popular amongst specific people and groups because they serve the person in some way. And for me, mindfulness is also can be connect, connected to this, what I call critical literacy in the book, which is actually deconstructing these frames and these narratives and saying, well, who's being served by this and who's not. And um, so for me, I often think, well, a lot of these stories in the Western spiritual community, or now the Western doomosphere, can actually just be helping people change nothing in their lives and carry on consuming uh, and just feel a bit less bad about it. So this is with Michael Dowd. I was always saying we're very interested to 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 explore this with him always, which is that you know he's spreading the good news that that actually after collapse acceptance there can be joy. Um, and and he was also not wanting to pass any judgment on what that might mean for people. And. And yet, if through collapse acceptance, you just want to fly around the world and go on cruises and fly first class and drive your SUV, then for me, there's, there's something going wrong there. There's a, there's a numbing that's coming from collapse acceptance. So this is why I say there's work to be done to help steward each other and help each other through this waking up to just how bad things are and why they got this way and what our options are and how we wish to be. 
Um, and it does require, as you were saying earlier, you know, good critical conversations between people who are happy to disagree, um, who want you know, to learn. not take it too personally, not try and cancel each other if you disagree. <laughs> Right. And that's what I liked with Michael, because we could talk about these things. And he, he totally got what I was saying. And he was just super exuberant about the joy of collapse acceptance as well. So um, <laughs> he wanted to focus on that. He was actually. Uh, after uh, my interview with him, his wife made an edited version of it. She said, you're one of the first interviewers who ever was, managed to slow him down enough to like, you know, you know, get it, you know, to interject questions and things like that, because he just gets so exuberant. Um, but I just had a thought yes. while, you were, while you were saying that, um, you know, I mean, your whole idea of collapse is a, it's a theory, but it's a very well researched theory. And you, you offer a lot of evidence in the book, chapter by chapter, and uh, how each individual area is unsustainable. And um, I would say that my notion or others' notion of um, some kind of enlightened age coming down the pike is also a theory, and it's it's more difficult to quantify. You know, you can't like measure temperatures and and this and that in in order to provide evidence for it. But my my measurement is in the realm of you know just so many convers my my life's experience, but so many conversations with people um, who are undergoing a, a spiritual transformation that m- might not at all be evident on the surface, um, but but that it makes me feel like something of this nature is epidemic in the world. It's a global phenomenon that doesn't come anywhere close to making the news or, or even showing up in a very manifest way anyplace. It's, it's more of a subjective experience that's happening uh, uh, among growing numbers of people. But as I said in the very beginning, I think our subjective state is the the, the sort of the, the fulcrum or the ultimate um, cause of whatever ends up manifesting on the surface. <laughs> um, and I think that if this subjective state becomes more the norm, and you used the word extraordinary earlier or something, um, so if it becomes more ordinary, then I think that all the surface structures of life will necessarily uh, have to change. And, and as we've seen, most, most of the people who run these structures don't change willingly. And so there's going to have to be some kind of cataclysmic uh, collapse in order for something new to arise. So I'm just carrying on from what I was saying earlier then. Um, I'm curious as to, because we, so this is not to, um, so there's two ways I could respond. One is to talk about the theory and the evidence for it. Uh, and then, then we would talk about, well, if that's happening, so what? Like, let's think about it. But another is to look at where the theory is coming from. So, which theory? The one you just mentioned. My the theory, theory, your theory? You're, yeah, which is that, you, that okay. there is a spiritual awakening under the surface um, mm-hmm. that is that has momentum. Um, okay, yeah, let's talk about where that comes may, from. Yeah, so what I'm interested in, um, um, would your life feel as good if you didn't believe that? Um, it's kind of a, a moot question because my life was going to shit before I learned to meditate. I had... Uh, dropped out of high school and gotten arrested a couple times and it was starting to use hard drugs. And then my life underwent a dramatic turnaround and has been, you know, had its ups and downs, but has been continually enhanced ever since over the last 55 years. And that's what has formed my uh, opinions about many things, just my own experience. But, but then that could be just your experience. And it but the, could theory be. That, the theory that there is a spreading uh awakening spiritual awakening um and there's momentum not necessarily that it will add up to you know whatever but but where would you be if you didn't believe that there was this uh momentum this spiritual awakening in other people and that possibly the opposites occurring i might be sort of more depressed i might be um pessimistic um but you know since i have been in touch with thousands of such people over the years. Um, I feel mm. like that that phenomenon is occurring, and it gives me some optimism. Okay. So what I'm getting at is that there is uh, there is a tendency in all of us to uh, look for what we want to see in the world, 
according to our identity and our stories of reality and our assumptions mm -hmm. and the culture that, and, and life experiences. Yep. And so, for example, if you yourself have experienced really tough, unbearable pain and you emotional, psychological, and you got through that through meditation and through a spiritual awakening, then you, you know, well, that, that pain. So you, when you see other people suffering in that pain, that must potentially, you must feel it hard. And it will therefore be a useful story to think that, yeah, but at least we're getting more and more people are getting out of that. So what I'm pointing to is that to become aware of how different theories of reality are ones that we can be choosing because of what they're doing for us. And what I've got from my spiritual uh, inquiry, if we call it that, is just to become more of a witness to like, oh, that idea, that appealed to me, that calmed me down. Oh, that one, I didn't like that idea. That didn't, that didn't. And so I just, so whenever I start to hear a theory of what's happening in the world, I wonder what it might be doing for someone and why they might like it. But the other thing is I... I'm also a sociologist and I'm look and I'm very critical of modernity. And so I'm immediately spotting the deep stories of our culture, such as progress and the idea that there needs to be, or there always will be a progression. And therefore that would be associated with scale. It wouldn't be just like one human out of 8 billion who progresses to enlightenment. No, there needs to be scale. There needs to be progress. There's the possibility that the opposite is the natural flow of life. The, there is the possibility that human extinction through a degrading of the spiritual awareness of more and more humans is exactly what was meant to happen. There's the possibility that's exactly what was meant to happen. There's the possibility with the fact that they have a quantum dance that bees are closer to enlightenment and higher consciousness than Homo sapiens and that actually the universe just needs to get rid of us. Possibly, I'm not saying that because I, th I don't want to dismiss all those incredible indigenous peoples who lived f fantastically in harmony with nature for millennia, but possibly the, the natural future of Homo sapiens is to become less awake, more numb, more aggressive, more stupid, more separate and fearful, and more deluded in our own. Maybe, you see, maybe. And, yeah, yeah. and what I'm getting to is that, that, that I don't know, but I don't, but I'm okay with the not knowing. And what's still true, what's still true for me is if I can be mindful, if I can be loving, if I can be courageous, if I can be curious, if I can be creative, and I can help other people that way too, and it might not add up to much. But for me, not being attached to outcome includes not being attached to the idea that humanity awakens. Okay, let me jump in here. Um, so, yes, I think not being attached is very important. There's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita which goes, you have control over action alone, never over its fruits. Uh, be not attached to the fruits of action, nor nor attached to inaction. Um, and and yet, you know, we, we all have all kinds of ideas. I mean, you have ideas that you're very quite certain of and quite, you know, committed to and so on. It doesn't invalidate them that you're committed to them, nor does it validate them. Um, it's just you have a lot of evidence based on your experience and understanding and research and so on. And um, so, you know, the things you said about the philosophical, more philosophical, spiritual type ideas that I've been espousing, the same thing applies. Um, you know, they're based upon my ex personal experience, my observation of other people's experience. Uh, and then there's, you know, like we mentioned, um, traditional cultures who talked about these things and prophesized that this or that might happen. In the Vedic culture, for instance, they have this cyclical understanding of history of yugas, you know, where it gets better, then it gets worse, then it gets better, then it gets mm -hmm. worse. And, uh, yes. you know, um, there are various arguments as to which point in that cycle we might be. But, um, but anyway, uh, I, I'm kind of so, losing my train yeah. of thought. So you go ahead. So, um, so the other thing I said was that I just wanted to make that point about what I, in the book, I call it critical wisdom, which is becoming aware of our attachments to stories because we're entering a period where there's going to be generalized anxiety and a lot of derangement. And so how can we be as kind and wise in that context? 
So one of them is to try and look at our deep stories and whether that's just we're just thinking what cultures made us think that makes us feel better in the moment or not. So I just wanted to make that point with that. Sure. But the other thing is, okay, I love your theory. I love the idea that actually Homo sapiens, I, I don't like the idea that Homo sapiens, and I reject the idea that Homo sapiens are the, the most important form of consciousness on the planet. I, we don't know. We just don't know. <laughs> uh, well, there's that bit about complexity we, that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. The, a human nervous uh -huh. system is a lot, a lot more complex than a bee's nervous system. Of course, the bees are essential and critical, and we'd probably all die if they all died. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> that alone could do it. Uh, but there is something to be said for a more sophisticated nervous system being capable of greater um, reflection or expression of the primordial intelligence that um, underlies and pervades the universe. Maybe, but also if we think of life forms as having a, a collective consciousness, uh, then, then the, the, the capacity for interrelationship between a, a swarm of bees may mean that there's some kind of consciousness there um, which is highly complex. Um, I, agree. I agree. What I loved is there's a fantastic. But I, I couldn't guy. have this interview with a swarm of bees, though. No, but then maybe there. Then, but then maybe our interview is is nothing compared to the, what the amazing stuff that the swarms of bees are doing. Um, but but also yeah, there's there's the there's the idea again from our culture that the 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 brain is so important in in mind, and yet uh, there's some really weird studies. Like there are individuals that had hardly any a cerebral cortex. Oh yeah, were actually, I know that they, they, they were like you know, a coconut. There was, the there was just some you know brain cells around the it's skull. It's just the, fluid the rest of it. The, the rest of it was stem. liquid. Yeah, and they were ca yes. carrying on normal lives. I know, but there's a lot like there's quite a few examples of that which completely challenge our notion of where intelligence lies in the body, or even if it's just in the body or not, or whether anyway. Right. So. And I'm so I'm saying yes, maybe, maybe, maybe humans are special, maybe. Um, but also maybe um, we're special to create the way for the really special species, which comes after we wipe out 95% of life on Earth, which it looks like what we're doing. And so maybe it's the future swarm of bees or, or a colony of ants in, you know, <laughs> 20 million years, who's actually, you know, that's where it's at for, for, for consciousness expressing itself through planet Earth. Who knows? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a, but anyway, what was, uh, what I wanted to say? Oh, yes. If we go with your theory, then, that I would test. I'm, I'm, I am a researcher, and I say, well, you know, you have a little bit of confirmation bias going on because you love talking to people who like talking about these things, and so you could triangulate that with data on uh, consciousness um, that people are, are experiencing um, and, and behaviors and all sorts, and 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 then you could. There's a whole debate there about well, what would be the sort of ob objective indicators of of uh, a spiritual awakening that's pretty pretty i difficult. got one for you okay um, i don't i don't know i mean i was in the tm movement for a long time right and um mm -hmm. one of the premises there was that collective consciousness is a thing and that it can be enlivened or influenced by large groups of people meditating uh t together so i participated in groups as large as eight thousand, and and we, we at some point we went to various i spent three months in iran you know with a group of people meditating before just before the shah left and and researchers um did a lot of studies on societal indicators economic and crime and and, and various things um and claim to find uh, I, I think they had a vested interest in making TM look good, but they claim to find a correlation between the existence of these groups and changes, me measurable changes in these indicators. And they they claim that the the um, p value or whatever was very strong. That these you know these studies really showed something was happening. So um, you know I'm I'm saying this with a you know a little bit of uh, uncertainty because um, I think there was that sort of agenda to to make tm look good but on the other hand maybe there's some truth to it and that would be and there's guys like rupert sheldrake you know who um and and some of his colleagues who tried to do research like rupert wrote a book called dogs that know when their owners are coming home um and they they used all sorts of uh, careful methods of controlling that the dogs had no way of knowing the owners were coming home very randomly yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm 
I, I, I'm pretty Sheldrakean. If you could, if one can, has anyone said that Sheldrakean? That's a good I, word. I lost my yeah. cat recently, and I was, I was, I was very upset. I, I have, I had telepathy with my cat, and uh-huh. and I know that can sound a bit wacky, but um, yeah, I, I believe it. <laughs> when my cat was stuck up a tree, it was the only time in my my life uh, with the cat in two years that I thought it's daytime. I need, for some reason, I need to go and look for Buki. I had to go out, and I and I found him, you know, eighty meters away, stuck up a tree, and they, they, so there's, and that's just one of one example, but yeah, so there is, ex, there is. It's weird stuff that can that I would just accept. No, that that's not chance. That's some kind of telepathy. Um, and then, yeah, but so I'm not arguing against um, also anything you've just said. But I'm saying neither of those two things are evidence that there's a momentum towards uh, a, a widespread human awakening, which will affect the destiny of life on Earth or Homo sapiens. Yeah. And. And I would be able to marshal lots of evidence. For example, in my lifetime, 50 years on Earth, uh, over 60% of wildlife has been wiped out. We're now down to um, wildlife on planet Earth constitutes 4% of all mammals. The rest of it's humans, our pets and livestock. And uh, and the carnage is extreme. And so, you know, if, 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 if a spiritual awakening is somehow happening, uh, well, that doesn't look very good. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm in, I agree. With, I've agreed with you from the outset that uh, that there seems to be a terrible collapse taking place. What we're possibly disagreeing on is what may follow this collapse. And I'm saying perhaps this will be a, like you said, a dark night of the soul, a dark passage of some kind, and there'll be a bright future on the other side of it but also perhaps not. And I wanted to make that point because you mentioned the word possibility a little while ago. And I I just want to make clear that I don't deal with absolutes or certainties. I I take everything as a hypothesis and I give everybody the benefit of the doubt, but I also take everything with a grain of salt and proportions vary. You know, if, if somebody tells me the earth is flat and I've actually, I'm aware of such people, (laughs) um, that's all salt to me. The, the earth is not flat. There's too much evidence that it isn't. But, you know, if they tell me some other thing, it's like, well, maybe you're right, maybe you're wrong. But I, I really am not wired in a way to be adamant about any particular idea, including all the ones I've made, all the points I've made hmm. today. So if and someone, I think that's a scientific attitude. That's the way scientists yeah. should think. And I'm not a scientist, but that's the way I think. If someone, yeah, if someone comes in, with the with the knowledge that I have after where I've conc- and it's not just I'm predicting collapse. I have a whole chapter, chapter one, which is talking about all the data going in the wrong direction since 2016 for for human society. So um, the human development the human development index has been going down in the majority of countries outside the rich world since 2016. Uh, it's been going down, including in OECD countries, the majority since 2019. And in, and some of that data is collected two years prior to being put into the index. Uh, and lots of other indices show the same thing. So we're talking basics, life expectancy, morbidity, yeah. um, all sorts of so going before the pandemic. So, and because it's global, it shows therefore a global set of processes are happening to cause that. It's mm-hmm. not just like one bad leader, oh, you know, we shouldn't have elected him or her or whatever, or yeah. that war, or that was a mistake. No, this is global. It's happening everywhere. So it suggests something global. So, so it's happening already. But, um, what was I wanting to say about, oh, can't remember now. Well, that was a prelude to saying something else. <laughs> It'll come back to you. Um, let me ask this question right. that came in, and um, then perhaps you'll remember what you were just going to say. So let me just get my glasses on here. This is from P.G. Woodhouse's grandson. No, I don't know about that, but it's Roe Woodhouse from London. How long was the Holocene meant to continue before we destabilize the biosphere? Oh, a technical question about climate. How long was the Holocene meant to go on for? Well, I... I well, that, tell, tell that us answer, what the whole could, scene is because could be, no, that, yeah. that could be answered by someone okay. who looks at ancient climates and Kondratiev cycles and uh, all and uh, all sorts. But uh, but um, what is the whole scene? Tell, go over tens that, of thousands so. of years. So I guess it would have been. It must be. Must be. 
thousands, if not tens of thousands of years, but I don't know. I didn't, I didn't look into that. Okay. Anyway. Google it. Look at how yeah, long Google it. <laughs> <laughs> Come back and tell us. Unless this is meant to be a, what, what is this meant to be a, is this a rhetorical question? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Did you remember what you were trying to remember? Yeah. I also believe that ideas are what ideas do. Stories are what stories do. I'm always interested in the implication. And so um, with the understanding I have of that we are already within a, an era of a creeping collapse of modern societies. If someone over here is saying, I want to tell you that um, this is the beginning of the age of Aquarius and we're <laughs> going to have a whole spiritual, you know, blah, blah, all that stuff. And, oh, really? I haven't heard that before. But okay. <laughs> you know, but is there something? I, and then someone over here is saying, I, um, this has broken my heart. I find it really difficult. I'm so sad about the difficulties that my children are going to face. I'm heartbroken that they don't want to have kids and I completely agree with them, but I'm heartbroken about that. Um, I want to do as much as I can to create, reduce as much harm as possible, to resist aggressive, authoritarian, nasty policies, to try and help uh, have a better quality of life for as long as possible with the least impact on the planet, relocalize supply chains, become less vulnerable to external shocks like a financial crisis. You know, so we've got someone over here saying, oh, this is just the nasty stuff we've got to get through till the global awakening and homo sapiens will finally reach their destiny as the higher consciousness species. And someone over here who's just being a bit more ordinary and kind and loving and heartbroken, I'm going gonna, I, I, I'm gonna to go over there. So that that's <laughs> and and I would say to that that somebody could be both of those. Somebody could say I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to mitigate the 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 you know the suffering. And at the same time, I think you know there's a good chance something ultimately good is going to happen. And it's really unfortunate. In fact, I think I think some of these spiritual teachers who've been coming out to the world in in the recent decades, um, who who actually gave voice to some of these predictions. Maybe their mission was to minimize the chaos to some extent by helping to accelerate the, the rise in collective consciousness, to minimize the suffering to some extent. You know, maybe they felt it was inevitable, um, but they just wanted to make it a little smoother if possible. I don't know. Um, um, yes, so I'm, I'm not entirely against uh, people being fully committed to doing all they can to encourage more and more people to awaken uh, to a deeper and higher reality, uh, spirituality, whatever we call it, I'm for that. But what I'm more for is, is love beyond hope. And for me, that was a core thing I got from Buddhism, where, where, where the Buddha in one of his teachings um, said, there's three kinds of people in the world. It's one, the man with hope, the one without uh, who's hopeless and the one who's done away with hope, who sees it as uh, drawing our attention to the future and therefore drawing our attention away from the present and therefore getting bound up with stories and pay and aversions and cravings. It's, it's just that we don't. We, so I, I, I'm trying to live and I'm excited by living hope free. Um, it doesn't mean I don't think I don't try and work out what, what, what might help. Um, but I don't, I, I don't want to, um, another way of talking about it is activism and social contribution, whether that's through doing what you're doing or working in community on organic permacultural, whatever is your chosen contribution, doing it as a gift. Uh, and, um, a gift doesn't need and doesn't expect an outcome or uh, a return. It's just this is this is me uh, sharing what's in my heart and what I want to do and what's me be most being me. Uh, so um, so yeah, love beyond hope and and in social engagement as a gift and not being attached to outcome. And because of that, I'm a little bit um, a little bit allergic to some of these 
stories about oh this is just the trouble we've got to go through to get to the other side and then well it's not it's not through. trivial i mean the way you're saying that makes it sound like oh there's a little bump in the road i mean it's it, it, <laughs> it could wipe out you know 90 percent of the world's population uh, so, yes. and that's that's not going to be pretty and it's not no. very pr- pretty in gaza and israel right now you know the, the, all, mm. it hasn't been very pretty in syria after the you know ecological disaster spar- spurred that up- upheaval um and anyway on your comment about hope um i don't i i think i might be kind of where you're at in that respect i don't like when i'm saying these things about a possible bright future i'm not dwelling in hope or or you know kind of like hanging my my emotions on that possibility it's more like a, a hypothesis again to use that word and uh, i you know i see evidence to suggest it might be the outcome but if it isn't then it isn't you know it's it's and i don't think it'll i don't really have a lot invested in that as an outcome it's not like not like the fundamentalist christian just staking everything on going to heaven after they die or something um you know uh, we'll see how it turns out and uh, you know and like you know the beatles sang in the revolution we're all doing what we can and i'm doing something i feel is having an impact and you're doing something you feel is having an impact and we can't all do everything so you know we're all ultimately on the same team i think um mm-hmm. and and we'll just see what where it mm-hmm. goes it's interesting you mentioned the beatles i I'm kind of, you know, they're reforming because Yoko Ono found a, a tape recording of John Lennon singing one of the songs. Oh, yeah. Um, they're using AI to make it all work yeah. together. And yeah. And I, I um, that. I'm actually secretly hoping it's really rubbish. Otherwise, I'll be sad that my dad, who was a Beatles obsessive, missed the final <laughs> Beatles song. <laughs> so I'm hoping it's really, really, really bad. Yeah. I was <laughs> a bit of an like, obsessive oh, yeah, dad, myself. Didn't miss I didn't anything. I can sing all the songs and with the lyrics, although not very well, but and all the harmonies. Oh, really? and, yeah, I love the Beatles. Oh, wow. they were great. Well, I was yeah, there yeah. when they were. My dad's you know, actually in the 60s. got some originals. He's got from the sixties, just over there, who are singles bought. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah, it was very exciting in in those days. I mean, w- when I was in high school and I want to hold your hand came out, all, all the kids would like open the car doors. Uh, of their cars and blast their radios and and it would happen they'd play that song every morning at the same time and people would be dancing in the parking lot um it was just like this cultural breakthrough after breakthrough with each new album that came out uh-huh. over, throughout the 60s yeah there isn't quite that shared experience anymore everyone's uh now it's all taylor swift own... well well I, when i say shared experience i mean yeah, okay, maybe there is a shared experience uh, for younger people on musically. I'm There is with some of them. I'm yeah. just I'm just I'm just on my own musical journey and yeah. I I got to thank uh SoundCloud and typing in ecstatic dance into SoundCloud and putting it in my ear to get me to to get the f- second half of the book done just working late into the night listening to these uh down tempo yeah. electronica wow. You stuff. actually wrote That's that book while listening going. to that stuff? Well, yeah, there's no words, really. It's just you, right. might, you might have some Native American stuff or uh, some Andean, I don't know, and <laughs> weird beats. Cool. But, um, yeah. Well, we're getting a little silly here. Did any more questions? Oh, a, a question came in, so we're going to ask that in a minute. Um, listening to music's deeply serious. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, I just find it divides my mind unless I'm doing something really mindless. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like right. it, I, I used to anyway. Um, so let me see. Anyway, yes, go back to your notes. What is it you wanted to talk to me about? Um, uh, we've got what another another ten minutes for our two hours. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. I'm just seeing if there's any little tidbits here. That Irene's going to send me another question in a minute. Um, or more than one. Okay, good. So we'll do that. And we've covered quite a bit. Um, we'll see what these. Let's, we we can even edit out this little hiatus and uh, and then really? just pick it. Pick, well, maybe. I Talking don't know. about the saying. Beatles? Well, no, we should leave that in. But right now we're kind of <laughs> in dead air. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe this, we've met a nat- maybe we've met a natural a natural end. No, there's some a c- couple of questions coming over right now. Ask them. So here we go. I think she just sent one. Here we go. This is from Sundarya M in India. Sometimes coming across people who suffer, victims, makes me suffer more than them even though we are strangers. How to break this pattern, especially in today's world where something or the other is going on in the world? Uh, 
Well, I've never heard that put in that question. What was it? Sundar, did you say? Uh, Sundaya. Sund Sundaria. I think she, she or he feels that um, okay. they have okay. so much I, empathy I have... that they suffer even more than the person who's suffering. Yeah, I am. Um, hmm. I'm, I'm a bit stumped by that question because um, we, we don't know the extent of another person's suffering or another animal's or other sentient creature's suffering. We, we, we don't know. We can, we can guess. But um, our suffering, meaning our emotional distress at witnessing that suffering, um, is actually a human virtue. It's one of the Brahma Vihara, one of the four natural ways of being. So what I what I loved about the Brahma Vihara uh, set of virtues is it's not saying what we aspire to, it's saying what's natural prior to injury, emotional, psychological injury of our culture. We are naturally empathetic and compassionate. Um, and so I would say, well, it's 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 very human and okay that you feel pain suffering at another suffering and but there's a however which is um if you're feeling it sounds like you're feeling so affected by it that it's causing you a problem and i don't know what in whatever way um and um so this often is 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 it can be a trauma response so basically there's there's unresolved emotional pain and, and psychological injury wounds that that aren't hell uh, haven't been healed and we've all got them um, so, but it means that we witness something and it's, 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 that's not making us feel that way, but it's, it's triggering something because of our own life experience and what we haven't healed in ourselves. Cause it's great to feel compassion and some pain when we, the opposite would be awful. But if it, if, it, if, if, yeah, if it's triggering a trauma response, it's becoming overwhelming. It's, it's, it's interfering with the rest of your life and interfering with making wise choices to promote joy and reduce suffering in the world as you can, then that's an issue. What to do about it? Key thing is so many people are getting into doom scrolling, as it's called. It's even got a word now, doom scrolling. Just paying attention to all the tra tragedies in the world, all the latest bad news about the climate or the, the hurricane here or the disaster there. And it is actually, uh, it is a way of not being present. It might feel like you're being present to the world suffering, but it's not. It's a distraction from it. It's, it's a way of, um, and often a lot of people will doom scroll. They'll then share that stuff on Twitter or whatever. And it's a way of just screaming ah, about it uh, rather than just, okay, there's pain and suffering in the world. There's a lot of it to come. Uh, how can I allow that somehow as part of my reality without it, um, without me becoming obsessed by it or it destabilizing me so I can't get on with, with the rest of my life. And, and there probably is healing to be done in order for one not to have a trauma response. And it may mean you need to switch off from, from seeing other people's suffering and focus more on self-love for a time. It comes in waves. You, you, there's only so much of the world's tragedies and suffering that we can take on board. So maybe just spend more time with self-love and healing the, your own injuries and traumas. Um, and then be happy with the fact you feel pain at another's pain. That would be... Yeah, that's a good answer. I, I, there's some, one thing I would add is be an ocean. If, if, if you try to dissolve some mud in a glass of water, it just really muddies up the water. But if, if uh -huh. you dissolve a handful of mud in the ocean, it's just, you know, dissipated. So if you can become oceanic in your consciousness, in your heart, in, in your inner reality, then you can, you, you, you can feel the, the tragedies of the world, but not be overwhelmed by them. And you can probably contribute more to helping mitigate them in some way. Like you need to be a good swimmer to be a lifeguard, you know? Um, all right, next question from Petra in London. If you are saying we don't know what's, the, what's for the best in the long run, then why do our best to stop the collapse? Hmm. Um, so... Uh, we can't stop the collapse. Um, that's my analysis. It's already begun. 
Uh, it's a creeping collapse. We don't know how fast it will go. I'm talking about a collapse of modern societies. It's associated also with the, the rapid degradation of the biosphere, so ecosystems all around the world and the derangement of the climate. And, um, and we don't know how bad that's going to get. We don't know if anything we do will make a difference. So the question then you asked is, in that case, we, the, the rhetoric was, why do your best? But why do anything to try and make a difference in that case? Um, it shouldn't be a rhetorical question. I actually think it's a, an, an example of the habit of modernity that we assume consequentialist ethics. Um, this is, it's... It's normal in all wisdom traditions that you choose to do things because that's the right way to live. You try to um, live a good life, reduce harm where you can, promote joy and love and care uh, where you can. You try, but it may not work. And so, Rick, you mentioned the Bhagavad Gita. It's in there. It's in Buddhism. It's in it's in all wisdom traditions. This, so it's the rise of consequentialist ethics. So where you do something because of a story that it's definitely going to have a positive impact. Um, that's just a, that's just a, a, an issue of the, the, the dominance of consequentialist ethics is an aspect of not modern culture. So I realized that doesn't help you then in choosing what to do. So, so I would, there's another question very, very, very um, close to the one that Petra, you asked. Or Petro. Is it Petro or Petra? I don't know how it's P E T R A. I don't know how they pronounce it. Okay, Petra. Um, another question is that how do I know what to focus on to try to help if I believe that my way of life is breaking down and will continue to do so? And when I don't know how fast that's going to happen? Well, there's no good answer to that. There's no one answer to that because we do not know in complex systems how quickly it's going to break down and where. We don't know. So I'm not going to give you a simple answer to that. What you can do is know what will help you be more kind, wise, and action-oriented, come what may. So you know that mindfulness and meditation will help. You'll know that having worked out what your sense of the purpose and meaning of your life is and your values are will help you. So you'll, you'll you know, you can't just, postpone that anymore you know we might be in a terrible situation standing in queues for rations with a world war three on within a couple of months even so you can't postpone these deep questions about the meaning of your life anymore so don't postpone it get on with it what yeah. is really important to you so how can you cultivate the way you wish to be there's lots of things of like that how can you not postpone these deep questions about the meaning of your life and what you what you believe in and then and then okay what's next well what comes next depends on those values so some people will think well i do actually want to try and give me and my kids uh, more years of quality life that's really important to me and it's probably more important to me than wake helping wake up all my friends and colleagues to the predicament um or it might be i want to do what i can to try and give humanity a better chance with climate change so i want to help reforest the world and cut carbon emissions and draw down carbon and and i think that maybe trying to push government to act through climate activism is what's for me and then okay go and do that i mean but you kind of you can't skip those first two things that I've just just mentioned because because anyone who comes along and tells you for certain this is what's going to happen, this is what you should be doing, and this is because of what the results will be, they're just talking nonsense. We're in a highly complex, unpredictable situation now, apart from knowing that things are breaking down. Yeah, and we all have roles to play, different roles, as we said. Yeah. Um, Petra's question reminded me of that story of the the starfish, I don't know if you've heard this one, but a man and a boy are walking along the beach and the tide has gone out and there are just thousands of starfish stranded on the sand and they're all going to die in the sun. And so as they walk along, the man keeps reaching down, picking up a starfish and throwing it in the water and they walk a few more steps. He does it again. He keeps doing that. And finally, the boy says, why? What difference can that make? There are thousands of them. And with that, the man picks up another one, throws it in the water and says, made a difference to that one. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm, 
that that resonates with me a lot. And as you say, people have different roles to play. So somebody somewhere on that beach might be sitting in front of a computer trying to work out how best to get as many of those starfish back into the sea. So they may be then trying to use Twitter or TikTok to get a whole bunch of people down to the beach. And then they might be calculating how long will it take to get that many people down and will the starfish have died because how long are the starfish going to live before they die? So how therefore, what should be the scope of my ambition for how many people to get to the beach in order to get, you know, someone who loves and being nerdy and calculating all that will do all that and then, and that might help too. Yeah, you might get an army of people down there and save all the stuff. Maybe. Or he might be too ambition and too right. ambitious and managed to get a thousand people from London to show up, uh, but they took till tomorrow to show up and all the starfish are dead. And it would have been better for him to just join the guy on the beach and chuck a few starfish in. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. We don't know. All right. All right. Here's go. Another... Otherwise, oh, otherwise oh, okay. uh, I told my I'll mom let... I'd have to... I'd only have two hours, and uh, okay, I'll let it's an important go. time in our in yes, our family history. Good. We had a couple so. more questions, but I'll let them go. So, um, and thank you so much, Jem, for your time. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed talking to you. I re enjoyed reading your book, and uh, I'll I'll be in touch. I'll send you a follow up email with a couple of thoughts. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Um, and yeah, to everyone who's watched this, interested, please please check the book out. Um, I'm quite proud of it. it. Took a long time. Yeah. And uh, it's a free Jambo download, Dell. right? In addition to buying yeah. a physical one, you can just download the thing and read a PDF if you want to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I prefer to listen to things and it's on Audible. Matthew Slater reads it, a friend of yours, yeah, and that's it right. does, it, does yeah. a really good job. All right. So yeah, thanks well, for those listening or watching. Um, and uh, thank you, Jim. And my condolences on your father's passing. And we'll, we'll be in touch. Thanks for all you're doing. Thank you. Cheers, Rick. Bye bye. Keep Here's. up the amazing work with this series. Bye-bye. I'll, I'll try to. Bye. <laughs>